the moment where I was like, oh, was when the CPA explained to me like, look, it's either right or it's wrong. And if it's wrong, you just figure out why and then you make it right. And after four years of like discussing 17th century lesbian poetry and like, well, what's your take on it? And, well, I don't know if I, how do you think that we're like this, the endless conversations, all of which were valid, but just this idea of like every perspective is the right perspective feels really overwhelming to my brain. And so this ability to just be like, nope, right, wrong, doesn't matter. And if it's wrong, you can make it right. Like this, it was just this like achievable perfection. Oh, like when does that happen in life? Bookkeeping, apparently. Welcome to Shitty Idea Time, creative business experiments uncut. Learn to stop censoring your big ideas with Tess Ball. Hello there, and welcome to another episode of Shitty Idea Time. I am your host, Tess Ball, your favorite business systems nerd and the founder of the Heart Driven Business Academy, a collaborative education hub for new and growing business owners. Uh, I am so excited to have on the podcast this week Ian Price Murphy. She's an incredible bookkeeper, the founder of Moxie Bookkeeping and Coaching, and one of the collaborators on the Heart Driven Business Academy. So I am stoked for our conversation. We talk about travel and self-defense and bookkeeping. And before we get into all of that, I want to share my pick of the week. My pick of the week this week is the Libby app. It's an iPhone app. You can probably get it on other phones too, but it gives you access to your local library's audiobook collection. I'm a big reader and I like to read while I walk. You cannot do that with paper books. So I like to listen to audiobooks and the Libby app has been awesome. It's a free resource and has just been so great during quarantine. About five years ago, I went on a stretch of only reading books written by women. About a year ago, I switched it up and chose to only read books by people of color. And this has been one of the greatest things I've chosen to do on the reading front. I am learning that we get such a one-sided perspective uh, in general, in our literature classes, in school, in the books that we are given to read, especially in the business scene. So if you are a new business owner, look at your business bookshelf. I am guessing it's a lot of white dudes. So my, my recommendation to you is to take a look at your bookshelf and see what is there and then see what's missing. See what, by contrast, you aren't reading, and then go pick up a book like that. A couple of these books that I've read in the past year that have been fantastic, Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall was totally awesome, 10 out of 10, would highly recommend, Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed, and then the book that I am most looking forward to and is in my holds list is How to Be Less Stupid About Race by Crystal Marie Fleming. So um, go check out the Libby app if you don't already. I know there's a couple other library apps that give you access to library books, later ebooks, audiobooks, etc. Um, but go check that out. See what what is out there. What could you learn? What could you explore? How could you grow? your perspective. So speaking of growing perspectives, without further ado, I would like to introduce this conversation with Ian Price Murphy. You see some uh, dog action in the back. He's sort of sleeping back there. Yes. What kind right. of dog? He's a pit bull. My pit bull sleeping right here. He's the cutest. I love him. We got him about six months ago from the shelter. He's seven and he is, I mean, I know everybody says this, but he is the best dog. He is. I feel like pit bulls in general. Pit bulls in general. Super Pits, cuddly. Pit mixes, like, they're just smushy big faces. I mean, you know, those little shovel heads. But he's, he's extraordinarily well trained. Like, he will sit and wait for you to tell him it's okay to eat. He's, like, been off leash since day one and is just like, but you're my human. Why would I go anywhere? So he's like, he's in, in no, no thanks to me. <laughs> What's his name? Thor. Which is a silly name. It was a name he came with. And so we were like, well, maybe we'll call him Theo or something. And he was like, but my name is Thor. But my and name is Thor. Yes. Yeah, he, he knew it. And I was just like, I can't, I can't undo seven years of what has obviously been very good training to be like, I want you to have my name instead of yours. So he's Thor. Awesome. So yeah. would you introduce yourself in your, yourself, <laughs> not just your uh, not just my dog. dog mom? Um, would you introduce yourself, Ian? Yes. 
I'm Ian Price Murphy. I am the founder and uh, partner at Moxie Bookkeeping and Coaching, which is a New York City based bookkeeping coaching CFO service that works with creatives and number phobes to make them feel empowered about their finances. I love that you turn this otherwise scary, intimidating thing called bookkeeping into a fun, approachable, digestible thing. What got you into that? Oh, uh, I fell into it. I fell into it. I um, graduated with a liberal arts degree, you know, so <laughs> then I tried to get a job. So I, you know, bartended and was a terrible waitress for a while. And um, uh, I did that for long enough that I ended up racking up so much debt, I actually filed for bankruptcy in my 20s. And it wasn't, I mean, you know, at the time that I filed bankruptcy, I was living with seven roommates. So it's not like I was spending like a maniac. I just wasn't earning any money. And because my income was dependent on other people, like who decided to tip me, um, and if a roommate decided to skip out on the phone bill or not, that I just, every setback just pushed me further into debt until I just, could, I just couldn't. So part of my deal with myself was that I would never be in debt again. And other than my mortgage, I'm not, which has felt really good. And it's been like 30 years now. Um, yeah, so I'm turning 50 this year for the math of that, just so you know. Um, which I'm actually really excited about. Totally. totally Happy excited. birthday and congratulations. Thank you. Bit. Thank you. I'm really hoping that this whole quarantine thing is over by August because August babies don't do solo birthdays. No. Leos are very, like, we just need a lot of love. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so part of that was, was becoming financially literate. And I was hired to be a, a friend of a friend's office manager um, and ended up getting her a computer and organizing her office. And um, she was a, an amazing artist. She did custom tile setting. So her work was gorgeous but she had really bad dyslexia to the point of essentially illiteracy. So like I had alphabetized everything and none of that worked. And so we had to come up with these creative solutions of, because she was so smart. She was so smart that, you know, tile setting. So it could be the address of the project. It could be the general contractor, it could be the first partner or the second partner or the designer. Like there was like 12 different names that you could refer to by any project. And she knew them all in her head interchangeably. And I was always like, what project is that? So I had to have a whiteboard that like wrote down all of the different versions of what she would call things so that I could understand what she was saying. And so we had like South Wall was still being estimated and North Wall was in progress and, you know, did everything by color coding. So we found a system that worked. Um, meanwhile, her accountant taught me QuickBooks and taught me bookkeeping. And, um, uh, you know, eventually all of the, people that she worked with who were interior designers and artisans were like, I need a bookkeeper. And suddenly I had my only marketable skill <laughs> and, and that's what it was. And so I did that for, you know, however many years, seven, eight years. And then I hired my first employee in 2003, Laura, who's still with me. Um, and we've just kind of grown since then. And, you know, every time someone asks me a new question, I go, I don't know. And now I want to know, let's go figure that out. So that's how we've, you know, morphed from bookkeepers into essentially CFO, you know, what do you do with the information now that you do it? So what I love about you and what I've learned from you is that systems are only good if they serve the people that they're supposed to serve. Um, and I love that you are, this advocate for creating financial systems that work for you, work for your business, make sense, are usable. Right. Have you always been like this natural problem solver? Have you always been good at that kind of thing? I guess I must have been. I mean, I've always been very pragmatic. And the, the, thing, the thing that I remember the moment where I was like, oh, was when the CPA explained to me like, look, it's either right or it's wrong. And if it's wrong, you just figure out why and then you make it right. And after four years of like 
discussing 17th century lesbian poetry and like, well, what's your take on it? And, well, I don't know if I, how do you think that we're, like there's the endless conversations, all of which were valid, but just this idea of like every perspective is the right perspective feels really overwhelming to my brain. And so this ability to just be like, nope, right, wrong, doesn't matter. And if it's wrong, you can make it right. Like this, it was just this like achievable perfection. Oh, like when does that happen in life? Bookkeeping, apparently. I love that. Yeah, me too. So, okay. So this idea of per achievable per perfection, are you, would you consider yourself a perfectionist? No, <laughs> but only because I believe other than bookkeeping and even sometimes in bookkeeping, perfection is a, um, an insane goal to pursue. It's tilting at a windmill. You know, it is like, go for it, baby. As long as it's fun, as long as you're getting something out of it, because you will never get there. It is, you know, it is like the perfect meditative state. Like there is no empty mind. It is biologically impossible. You can get to a place where you are super darn close and, and able to let everything flow by where it doesn't bother you. But like, to me, that's what perfection is. It's just, it's the like insane insanity level. Yeah. So this whole project, the shitty idea, the shitty idea time thing <laughs> was created because I feel like a lot of us struggle with the pursuit of the right thing or the perfect thing or not being shitty. Like we really don't want failure. So if somebody is looking at starting a business and they're like, oh, this bookkeeping thing is really scary. I don't want to fuck it up. What are some of your top tips to turn this uber scary thing into bookkeeping? What it is? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I love my crazy metaphors and I love mixing them up. So I'll start with a swimming metaphor and end up in a travel metaphor. But I, a lot of times I'll talk, the, the ones that I, my sort of top, let's think about this in a new way things are, you know, if you can remember back to driving a car and here you are being put in a multi-thousand pound death machine and being told, oh, don't worry about it. And you're seeing people whip by you, some of whom are not driving well, objectively not driving well, and it's terrifying. But that, you know, eventually you just acclimate to that terror and up your own skill to the point where if suddenly you're the one, the wackadoodle flying down the freeway at maybe 15 over the speed limit, maybe not with your full attention on the road. And things are generally fine. So some of it is just that. Some of it is you just need to get used to this new thing. Um, and you know, one of the beautiful things about using bookkeeping software is unless you delete it, you cannot fuck it up. It can always be undone. So like just, you know, if you just throw it in, if you don't like it, we'll, we'll edit it later. Yeah, it's a waste of time, but that's how you learn. You know, and, and even just this, I think there's a lot of, you know, perfect is the enemy of done stuff. But I think part of the problem for me is, my interpretation is, I don't know that any of us are really pursuing perfection. Somebody probably is. I think we just, I think we just want it to be good enough. And that's the tragedy is like, you know, we just don't, we just don't want to, put ourselves forward as not shitty and then be shitty, you know, like, because to be fair and to be truthful, there is a minimum bar that really should be reached, you know, and I think art is a perfect example of that. Like I can draw something and it will be fugly. There's, it's just not in my skill set. And so, you know, people can be like, oh, but it's beautiful to create. I'm like, yeah, but nobody but me wants to see, even I don't want to see this. I, I want to do it, but I don't want to see it. Like, I'm going to throw it away when I'm done. And, and so I would not feel comfortable putting myself forward as an artist. And thankfully, I have no desire to do so. But what if I did? You know, and, and that's kind of where bookkeeping gets so sticky is this is something that in order to do, in order to have the impact that you want, with the thing that you are really good at, you have to be able to get this done too. And like, can I, 
can I do it? And that's why I'm always just like, no, just think of it like driving a car. It's, it'll be scary for a while and then it'll be fine. Um, you know, my other favorite is to talk about going to the dermatologist. This is a, a real life experience for me where I was, you know, I'm pale, let's just say pale, and went to the dermatologist and was like, I have a little thing. We have skin cancer in my family. And he looked at me and he's like, no, no, it's fine. Um, but we should check you. So take off all of your clothes. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> like this is the dermatologist. I'm not wearing my doctor underwear today. Like I was not, I was not ready. And of course, you know, but that's the, when you have um, high risk for skin cancer, it's the things you can't see or don't see or don't look like cancer, but don't scare you. Those are the things that get you. So it was an appropriate procedure. I just didn't know and wasn't ready. And I feel like a lot of people have that with me too, where they like, I'm like, great, let's just dive into your books. And they're like, you just asked me to get naked for you. And I'm like, I know, but I see this all the time. Don't worry about it. So I don't, you just got to do it. You just got to do it anyways. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to go there. I too recently went to the dermatologist and, you know, I, I have some weird looking moles and I was so relieved when she's like, let me, let me look at your other, nope, you just make weird looking moles. Yeah. And I feel like you are the bookkeeper that while you might be like, I need you to strip down, you're also the one that's like, well, your weird looking moles are just cute. Your yeah. fucked up bookkeeping is just fine. <laughs> yeah, it is. Because if it's not, we'll be like, hmm, let's just cut, let's just pop that one off and see how bad it is. Eh, it's fine. You know, it's, it's, again, it's no, it's not like, oh, you have a, I mean, right. So if you do have skin cancer, they just take it off. Like, it's not like, oh God, you're dead now, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's the same thing. Even if you fuck something up, like we are advanced enough at this point in our history that there is a solution for almost everything. And the more common it is, the more common the solution is. So yeah. Yeah. Dermatology. Fun though, right? Fun. <laughs> yeah. Be, being Scandinavian and have, having weird looking moles, man. It's just a just thing. part of the gig. It's just part of the gig. Part of the gig. So can you describe the ideal bookkeeping client? Can you talk about, you know, when you're working with a small business owner and they come to you, like, what are some of the qualities that you love in your clients? I, I mean, the qualities that I love in my clients are different than the qualities that I love in our relationship. So let me just start with the relationship. The qualities that I love in the relationship is people who are interested, um, involved, and collaborative. Like I, I don't want to entertain your fear that this is that you're not good at this. You know, again, you probably weren't great at driving a car before you drove a car. Maybe you were. Who knows? So this idea of this is a skill that I want to learn, not necessarily master, but just learn enough that I can see what I need to do next. And if I hand something off to feel like I know what's happening and that I can review the results, you know, so, so to me, that's it. Um, and then, the, you know, the people, obviously the people I get along with best are people who are fun, sassy, bold, you know, creative compassion is huge. Um, I love working with people that are, you know, that feel like they're doing something great in the world, whatever that means, you know, that could be crocheting arm warmers. I don't know, but just something that they're like, I do this because I love it. It brings me joy. I'm good at it. And it's good for other people. And I go, that's so awesome. I totally can't do that. Let me help you with the part that you don't want to do. And honestly, probably shouldn't be doing because it's not the best use of your time. Um, yeah, I just, I love being part of the team. It's, and I just met so many cool people <laughs> over the decades and been involved in just some amazing, amazing work. Um, and it just feels like such a privilege. I think to a lot of business owners, it's, it could be surprising to hear collaborative as being a part of the ideal scenario. I think oftentimes we think of bookkeeping as like totally separate from us. Like I hand over 
this task to another person. So can you describe a little bit about that collaboration piece? Because that might be exciting to some people. I know I was excited. I was like, what, my book, you, it can be collaborative? Yeah. I could learn stuff? Well, so I, and I think some of the reason that that might feel a little new is the fault of the bookkeeping industry. You know, that I have definitely taken over for bookkeepers who were like, yeah, I don't let my client in their books. And I'm like, but they're their books, not your books. And they're like, oh yeah, but they just go in and make things messy and then I just have to clean it up. And I'm like, you know, if that were your kid, would you just clean up after them forever? Or would you be like, hey, socks go in the bin, you know, hey, you know, wash behind your ears, whatever it is. Like it's part of developing a, a broader base, whatever. So because so much of it is simple and, you know, it's bookkeepers are very task focused, not people focused in general. So I think that this, you know, the tendency of people to say, oh, I'm no good at numbers has been, again, overly um, coddled by people who are like, yes, you are, baby girl, you are terrible at numbers. You just give it all to me and I will send you a giant bill. And I'm sure it's just my personal perspective of like, I didn't suck at money. I just didn't, I just didn't know the language. I didn't know, I couldn't read the signs. You know, you are heading towards bankruptcy. <laughs> Make changes now. I'm like, what a funny looking squiggle. So, so it's, it feels very important to me that people not feel disempowered about their own money, first of all, but, but your business, this is your life you know, and oh my God, like I just, I, so yeah, of course, obviously I think, and, and the people that are like, I do want to learn, like, I don't want to be an accountant. I don't want to be a bookkeeper. I don't want to have to know whether, you know, a debit subtracts money or adds money, but like, you don't have to know any of that shit. Just, you know, where did the money come from? Where did it go to? It's, it's all, it's cool. So most 80% of it is so easy. And the other 20%, we got you. That's awesome. So you are a bookkeeper, but it, you have this natural tendency, I think, to be a teacher. Like you are an educator. Yeah. Have there been other instances in your life where you have fallen into the role of teacher? So yeah, super nerdy story. One of the questions that has been asked in some of the conferences I went to was like, what did you want to be as a kid and, and are you doing it? And that was the moment where I was like, wow, because yeah, even as a, even young, I, you know, I grew up in Northern California and I went to this series of hilarious, wonderful schools. Um, my K through second grade was called the carousel. It was a round building, literally painted like a carousel. And we did like the whole parachute balloon thing. Like it was, it was hippie central. So I went to I, carousel preschool. Hey, yes. I went to Montessori preschool, which is also the same thing, right? Like super groovy. Um, so, you know, I loved my teachers because it was West Coast. We called them by their first names and like hung out with them at break. And I just was like, you know, by the time I was six, I was like, I want to be a teacher. That's it. I want to be a teacher. And, um, and that persisted until I went to college and was a teacher. <laughs> and I, my senior internship um, for college was teaching at a last stop high school in the Lower East Side of New York City um where you know i was there all year and it's you know by the end of the year probably half the male students were in jail and probably half the female students had dropped out cuz they were pregnant um and the ones that remained were uh not well cared for by life society etc um you know there was one girl that slept all day through class and i of course you know bold little teacher went to went to my supervisor and I was like I don't, I don't think she should be sleeping all day and he was like listen she lives with her mom and her sister her sister just had a kid all three of them are HIV positive she she works all night she cares for her entire family who knows how long any of them are going to live this is the only sleep she gets honestly we can't do anything for her I wish that we could you know we support her as best we can but like English is not English lit is not something that's going to serve her at this point in her life. And I just was like, this is not what I signed up for. Like, this is not, I don't, 
I don't have the emotional resiliency to face this kind of um, brutal reality every day. And so then I tried a couple of different places and I was like, I, it turns out I don't like working for anybody else. <laughs> turns out I want to do things my way and I want to be able to say, that's stupid. Let's fix that. You know, like, why are you going to make her sleep on a desk then? Let's just write her a note, get her to the nurse's office and let her like get a real sleep for an hour. And so this, you know, and, and so that was kind of it. I just eventually made that all come together and yeah education and bookkeeping and finance and me getting to call my own shots. <laughs> so I, I hear through the grapevine, you've also taught self-defense. You spent oh, a good yes. long while. Yes. For about 10 years. I totally forgot. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I, I, and that was one of the things too, was I um, living in a city as a young woman, you know, as you do. And um, I was <laughs> no surprises. I was one of those best defenses or good offense girls. So, you know, part of what that meant is that as I was bartending and closing up the bar in the middle of the night and getting ready to walk home, um, someone inevitably would say, would you like me to walk home with you? And I'd be like, no, why? Um, you know, which is fine. Uh, you know, and if anyone gave me side eye, I would immediately charge them. I would throw punches like, you know, no good, no good. But, um, but so much of that came out of this insecurity of what if, like, what if I throw a punch and they don't care? What if they duck it? What if that, that, that? So um, I had been, you know, meaning to take some sort of safety class forever, as we all do. And then um, the opportunity came up and I just was like, yeah, good timing. Why not? And so I did this very particular kind of self-defense that's called impact. Um, they talk a lot about they talk about it a lot in this book called The Gift of Fear by this guy Gavin De Becker, which is a really intense book, um, but it has a fantastic chapter about like how to read you know um, people's intentions through their words. And so it's a twenty hour class, you know. And I went in basically just me, um, and and came out a came out a badass. Like it was amazing, and and it. Uh, it changed the way that I dreamed. Like I no longer had those like running through slow motion molasses dreams. I would like turn around and fuck a motherfucker up in my dream. I'd be like, oh no, no, no. And I had this muscle memory of what it felt like to effectively have full contact force. So I was like, uh, I, I, you know, again, me, I'm all in, I'm in. So I interned, I'd studied, whatever, and then I and then I taught for decades um, with with a couple of different chapters of it. Um, the the one that I love the most because I had the most experience with is based in New York City. Um, they're called Prepare, uh, and they're just like it's just one of those things. You know, they'll teach girls as young as like six or seven. We had an 83 year old grandmother in our class. They're trauma sensitive, so like if all you can do is take 20 hours and learn how to yell once loudly, like that is amazing and genius. And um, it was the first experience I ever had seeing uh, what I think of as regular women's bodies, like middle-aged, middle weight, you know, not particularly athletic, kicking ass. And the instructor, one of the instructors at New York, her name's Karen. She's like this tiny, round Jewish lady, you know, she is, and she's super funny. So she's just like, you know, she's just cute. But when she goes to fight, like, mm -mm, I definitely want her on my team. And that was part of it too, was it was one of the few areas in life where there is a room full of women totally committed to supporting each other. And it's just like one of those things that's so beautiful. It makes me cry almost every time I see it. And I am not a crier, but it just, it's, it's fucking powerful, dude. And it's something I just think everyone should do. And they have like mixed gender and men and, you know, non-binary classes and stuff like that too. But, but I think that there is something specific about um, scratching that part of your neurobiology that talking can't get to. And so especially if you've had some physical negative experiences, I mean, I know 100% of us have had negative experiences, 
most of us have had some, you know, like at some point it's been uncomfortable, but there is a line that, you know, that just to, to be able to feel that power come back into your body. And like, you can see it. There's women who come in, I'm sure I was one of them, who you just see this like crackly ex exterior and it just like gets absorbed into this like core. Oh, it's just awesome. I can't say enough good about it. So there you go. That's a very long answer to a very short question. Oh, I love it. I love, I want to, I want to take this. Oh my God, you have to go. I, I too have been in the, like, I should do that one day. Yeah. Um, very cool. Yeah. So, moment, the moment quarantine ends, go do it. Awesome. I think it's worth a trip to New York, by the way. I, I mean, think I worth, think anything is worth a trip to New York. Having lived there, I'm like, when do I go to go see my best friend? Yeah. I don't need many excuses. Yeah. So I just finished a coaching program that was, a, you know, women up leveling their businesses. And of course, many of us have stories about not so great childhoods. And that was one of the things was, I was like, because we all have a conference in September. And if we're all allowed back outside in September, I was like, I'm just going to organize a weekend class, you know, because you can get it done in as little as like 16 hours, you know, two eight hour days. Saturday, Sunday, yeah. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people can still hang out in the city on Friday night, Monday, whatever. So I will keep you posted. Keep me posted. Yeah. So awkward segue time. Um, <laughs> let's talk about other women's issues. And I put women's in issues in quotes. Um, you have made a choice to be child-free. Yes. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, can you describe or tell us like how that came to be? Yeah, I don't know what, I don't know where I came from, first of all. Like, I feel like in some ways I like dropped into this world relatively fully formed. Um, because obviously, although many things have changed in terms of my attitudes or whatever, again, I've just never, I've just never wanted kids. I just, you know, maybe that's because my sister was a holy terror when she was a teenager. Um, Younger sister? Older sister. Older sister. She's amazing. I love her. But there was, she just, I mean, again, she, she turned 17 when she was about 12 or maybe even younger than that. And she just was like, I'm an adult now. I'm done. I'm responsible. You know, um, you can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. And uh, my poor father, who's a like lawyer slash jazz musician, had a bumper sticker that said question authority. And she's like, you guys are the ones with the question authority bumper sticker. And he's like, not mine, not my authority. <laughs> so yeah, so I just very early, um, she moved out and I moved out when I was 15, but she moved out like into a friend of hers house, I think in eighth grade, like she ran away multiple times very young. And so, you know, when I was in middle school, I was already like, I see this, you know, zero control, 110% responsibility. For someone else, I was like, no thanks, not doing it. I was always down to be an aunt. I, my sister's actually also child-free, but for a long time, she was like, I'm going to have eight kids. I was like, perfect. So neat. Um, but it, it didn't happen. But we have a very big, close family. So, you know, it's, it's fine. Yeah, so that was it. So, you know, I, I uh, lobbied hard to get my tubes tied when I was 30. Um, it, it took some doing. You know, I knew that I had to wait until I was 30 to do it. And even though I had a female doctor, you know, part of the process was she tried to give me a psyche valve. And I was like, absolutely not. I was like, you can talk to my current therapist. You can talk to my mother. You can talk to my pediatrician. <laughs> you know, you can talk to all the people that have known me forever. But like, this is not a psych issue. This is something that I want to do with my body because, you know, and she was like, all right, well, let me put it to you a different way. She's like, what if you find a partner who wants a kid. I was like, then we can adopt. Like, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't have any, it's just missing. I don't have that biological drive, you know? And I've actually heard, I can't quote the source, so I'll just pretend like I'm saying this. I've actually heard that it's part of an evolutionary um, strategy that like one out of 10 people, it's one of the reasons that queer people exist is because one out of every 10 people need to be around to help care for everybody else's kids. <laughs> yeah, I've not heard that. Right. I can't remember where I heard it, but I just was like, cool. Like that's, we serve a very important 
function to the continuation of our society to like choose to be a supporter rather than a doer. Fuck yeah. So one thing that not having kids as a, as a fellow child free woman, um, you get to travel a lot. There's a, there's a lot more freedom of choice. Tell me about your travel obsession. Oh, yes. So I, um, I did some like volunteer travel in high school. I did uh, a program called Amigos de las Americas, which takes high school kids and sends them into Latin America to learn Spanish and exchange cultures and to like do sanitation projects. So we were, um, you know, building latrines and bringing toothbrushes and education again. Um, and it was super fun. Um, and you know, my uh, grandmother and her sister, my great aunt, who's actually the woman that raised me while my dad was playing music and my mom was in medical school, they had been born and raised in Cuba. So Spanish was already a big part of our house and, you know, culture. So it felt very fun to go do that. And um, I went to Spain when I was in high school. I had a trip planned that I think has just been canceled for October of this year to go to Tanzania. Um, everybody in my family loves to travel. Everybody's been everywhere. And, and a, lot of the, a lot of them have been to weird places. Like my mom did uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility in the 80s, which was like Doctors Against Nuclear Proliferation. Proliferation. So she went to Russia, like when that was a no-go zone. My dad's jazz band was the first American band to play east of the Ural Mountains. Like you know. Um, so anyway, so my my dad's brother, my uncle, who's now passed, he and his wife used to travel all the time, and they went on safari one year. And he's just like a psycho extrovert. He makes friends with everybody. Both my uncles are this way. And so he like fell in love with the driver, the tour guide, and became best friends with him and like became pen pals with him and went back to visit him and got invited to his wedding. And um, so he said, I'll come to your wedding, but you have to take me to your village. And Jackson was like, my village is a shithole. You don't want to go there. And my uncle was like, what are you talking about? Of course I do. You're from there. It's fine. So it was a shithole, you know, as many undeveloped places are. Um, and so when my uncle passed, my aunt was like, well, let's, we'll just keep helping him. So they actually have a fund and my aunt goes every couple of years and they've like built two water cashments and rebuilt the school and provide food for orphans. And it's very um, fun because, you know, charitable giving can be a little fraught sometimes. And so basically what she does is she just goes every couple of years and talks to the council of elders and they have this community-wide meeting and people say well what do you want what do you want and they decide and then she goes okay how much do we need for that and then she'll go out and fundraise so there's no top down we're bringing you this um, and I have a lot of respect for her because there have been some ideas like solar lamps that she was really excited about and they were just like we don't want that though and she was like okay I mean I think you should want it but you don't so we're not doing it um, so I was going this year to go help do that and I've never been anywhere on the continent of Africa before so next year maybe we'll see mm. <laughs> well maybe maybe in the meantime you could get a self-driving biodiesel airstream yes and travel around that way yeah almost Technology okay that is the weirdest travel what dream. how so I mean it's it's fucking <laughs> cool like I'm into van life we have been planning out van life for Self-driving biodiesel. I yeah. dig it. Tell me more. So it doesn't exist yet, but it should. It will soon. It should. Right? Self-driving cars are about to happen. Um, I actually, I, for the first time in my life, bought a brand new car this year, a 2019 Nissan Leaf, fully electric. Plug it into my solar house. It's awesome. I love it. And it has this thing called like ProPilot or who knows but it basically is self-driving. Like it yells at me if I take my hands off the wheel, but it will like keep me in the lane. So as long as I don't have to take an exit, that thing más o menos drives itself, like pretty much drives itself. And so of course the first thing that I go is like, well, that's cool, but you know, van life, I want, I want to be able to go to sleep in one national park and wake up in another. And if I have to draw circles on my eyes so it looks like I'm awake and duct tape my hands to the wheel so that I don't get pulled over, I'll, I'll do it. I'm into it. I just think that that's, 
that's the dream. <laughs> so Ian, this brings us to the part of the show where we get to play an epic game of Would You Rather? Oh, yes, okay. So, would you rather, knowing that you have to take a year off of your life, huh. yep. you are given a self-driving biodiesel Airstream, although uh -huh. you have to pay for all of the, like, the, yeah, yeah, the I'll biodiesel do it. stuff. I'll you know, you have, to, you have to do the maintenance. Yep. But it's, it's essentially paid for. It's yours yep. for this year. You have to hit every 50 states. Uh huh. Those are the parameters. Um, would you rather... Oh, okay, we say 49. How do I get to Hawaii? Um, you. I have to figure it out. That's part of the deal. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. <laughs> and maybe, maybe there's a way to teleconference. The. I have a really funny anecdote. Okay, before we go on, do it. In college, I'm not going to do this. Okay. Oh, so anyway. What? <laughs> No, you have to know that. <laughs> okay, so I was friends with a group of, so I went, to, I went to school in the South. No offense to anybody who like got their education in Mississippi. Like just wanna throw that out there, but like statistically it's not great. So we were looking at the back of a book, um, Call of the Wild, and yeah. we got to talking about taking a road trip to Alaska. And one of my friends, I will not mention his name, um, is like, but you can't road trip to Alaska. And we're all like, why can't you, why can't you road trip to Alaska? He's like, come on guys, you, you can't road trip to Alaska. And we're like, what the fuck are you talking about? You can obviously road trip to Alaska. At the very moment, all of us understood that he thought Alaska was next to Hawaii on the map. Like, oh, because it, it is next to Hawaii on the map. Because it was yes. next to Hawaii. So he thought Alaska was an island next to Hawaii. Yeah. So that would also, if that were true, potentially pose a problem to your road trip. Problem. I'm not great at geography. Every now and then I love to say, and I'm a college graduate. Like things that everybody should know that I don't know. And I'm like, P.S. Thousands of dollars spent on education. <laughs> and I don't know basic <laughs> geography. So cool. I am terrible at geography too. Yeah. Okay. So okay. this year, you have to get to all 50 states or yep. 49, whatever. Would you rather have a business traveling around in your Airstream teaching self-defense classes? Mm. Super cool. Or organizing and running these like vacation destinations for other kidless women or, or non-women, really? <laughs> um, I'd rather teach self-defense. I mean, as long as I didn't have to like organize, as long as I didn't have to do the marketing of it. Oh, you have to do everything. Oh. Pff, yeah. Oh, you are like, you are solopreneur on the road. Yeah. Or you could, I mean, you could hire somebody, but you have to make I sure would have to hire feasible. somebody. So let's talk business yeah. model. I would have to hire somebody. So I could definitely, yeah, I could hire a VA who could then coordinate local sponsorships, local points of contact coordinators who I obviously would then have to take out to dinner in my Winnebago because why not? Um, even though I'm a terrible cook. Uh, yeah, no, that would be way more fun for me. That would be way more fun. fun teaching self-defense. Yeah. And I, I love traveling with other people, but I love going on their agendas. Like I don't like being the agenda person because I'm just, I'm always like, I don't know, let's go explore. So you yeah. are not the organizer. No, I, I, def I mean, I can organize, you know, people always talk about like, who's the alpha. And I always joke and say, I'm the Omega. Like, I'm the cleanup crew. Like, if nobody else has stepped up, I totally will. But I'm so happy to be like, oh, you've got an idea? If I think it's a good idea, I'm totally on board. Like, I don't need to be in charge of shit. That's awesome. Okay, so let's explore this idea of traveling around the country in your self-driving biodiesel Airstream, teaching self-defense. Yeah. Um, because I think so many people have these, these amazing ideas, and we all of a sudden are scared. Like, will it work? Will it not work? And so I want to explore how to create a business model for really any idea. Yeah. So how would you make money? Um, uh, through sponsorship and classes, you know, sponsorship and classes. So I, I, and it's funny because like, it so easily lends itself to the business model that goes to everybody, which is, well, what can you do? What can't you do? Like right away, I'm like, well, I'd have to hire a VA because I can't do the marketing. 
you know, and she would have to coordinate with all the local people because I don't know, I don't have time to research that, but, you know, certainly there's going to be community centers and, you know, women's organizations or, or just organizations in general who have the space needed and the stuff needed and we just show up and bring our expertise and have fun and then are like, bye. Um, and the Instagram on that would be really fun. The Instagram on that would be so fun. Yeah. So although you're not managing the marketing and the outreach, you are still managing the Instagram account is what I'm hearing. Yeah. I mean, that's what I do now. <laughs> like, I just want to do the stuff that I want to do. And that's what everybody else is for is to be like, yeah, I really like that part. Can you, can you do that for me? So, yeah. Awesome. So how would you... What is the story behind it? What is the marketing angle, if you will? Like, how would you work with your VA to convince these places that like this weird traveling woman is gonna come in and teach people how to punch people? Yeah, it's, that's, um, I think that's part of the reason that I don't love marketing is I feel so clear on my purpose and value but I assume that you are smart enough to know if it's right for you or not. And I'm really bad at, you may have heard me complain before the like, but you can't afford not to. Like, as soon as I hear that, I'm like, I don't, I don't care if I had my credit card in hand. I'm done with you. I'm done. Nope. 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 Guilt poop. Yeah. So, I, oh, go on. I was just going to say, and so I think that, you know, the challenge for marketing for that specifically is the the idea that this is something so big that we've all lived with for so long that we it's all it's been on everyone's to-do list and so what is the thing that gets you to do it nothing you know it and and having done some market research for that specifically it's actually um people in transition is where people are willing to do self-care, self-defense. They're going off to college. They're starting a new job. They're ending a relationship. There's something where there's like already change and upheaval where they kind of are reassessing life and they're like, now it's my time. I'm doing this. So it's really interesting to try and catch people at that moment. Well, and I think that actually really lends itself well to this idea of travel and transition and movement. And it's all very thematic. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. So definitely you'd want to partner up with a, like a women's solo travel thing, um, you know, and maybe even do some like arrive to your international airport two days early and we'll do this fun thing. Cause I mean, again, much like bookkeeping, it sounds awful and there can be moments where it feels awful. But once you get to the other side, you're like, I don't know why I didn't do that decades ago. Yeah. So I'm glad that you mentioned bookkeeping because we're totally going to talk about the finances of this thing. Um, one thing that I learned from you, probably like the most interesting, fascinating thing that you taught through the courses is this idea that your bookkeeping system should me measure the things that you want to be measuring. Um, that your chart of accounts, that list of categories of expenses and, um, that that chart of account should reflect what's actually happening in your business. So can you talk about as the owner of this business, what you would want to measure, how you would maybe categorize your finances, what that system could look like for you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think that it would be important to measure and evaluate streams of income. So, you know, what is the sponsorship income that we're getting? What in-kind donations, if any, do we have? What are the actual class sales? And there would probably need to be some online point of sale that's like by age, by region, by whatever, um, length of class. And a lot of those things, you know, are kind of bookkeeping, but not really. Like a lot of that's really just sort of project management. But that's, you know, that's the first thing is, how am I earning money? Where's the money coming from and how am I getting it? And how do I get more, obviously? And then, you know, the just tracking the things that you would have to track in order to make sure that you're functioning profitably. So 
you know, if there's a great opportunity in Florida, but I'm in Illinois, like, does it make sense to spend the biodiesel money to get all the way down there? Or do I need to stop and make money along the way? You know, how much backtracking can I do? Um, and in the beginning, I would imagine there would be a fair amount of that. So again, you know, how much can I afford to spend on the travel time and cost before uh, it becomes cost prohibitive to travel outside of a certain number of miles? Yeah. And then obviously I would do profit first to make sure that like I, my gas account would be different than my, you know, whatever account, space rental account. Yeah, because I'm guessing that like if I go into QuickBooks or Zero or whatever bookkeeping software I have as, you know, this this random business owner, the standard categories aren't really going like where does biodiesel fuel fit in? I mean, kind of transportation, but is it an office expense? Is it a business expense? Well, hopefully everything is a business expense, right? And again, that's sort of one of the questions is like, well, how do I write this down so that I can write it off? It's like, well, the moment you write it down, you're planning to write it off, I hope, because that's what a business expense is. Um, you know, and I think probably a standard chart of accounts has auto expenses on there. But again, that's not the same as fuel. Like if, if my business model is based on me driving around, then I probably want to know my fuel costs as well as my maintenance costs. Because again, if I can get an extra gas tank and fill it up in the States where biodiesel is the cheapest, you know, and then just refill myself in the States that it's not, that potentially could save me money or the extra weight could, you know, reduce the efficiency and be totally a wash. Um, so yeah, so the idea of like, what is an office expense and I think, again, this is just like getting familiar with the grammar of bookkeeping. Like, well, is it part of your office? If I'm driving around, no, it isn't. You know, my telephone is, my website, maybe. Um, but just really thinking about things in terms of, is this the money that I had to spend in order to earn money, which in my case, you know, fuel to the location would actually be part of my cost of goods sold because that's, I need to say, like, it's not like, I made $1,000 on the class and yay, it was like, right, but then I spent 800 in fuel because I went from Illinois to Florida. Um, so, so just having those sort of tracked, you, you know, and I, when I'm working with someone, I almost always just say like, just think it out, just think out loud. Like, what are the things you care about? How do you earn and spend money? And then what makes the most sense? And every now and then I'll be like, ah, I really cluster that over here. But most of the time I'm just like, great. If that's what you want to call it, let's call it that. Awesome. So at the end of the year, the project goes well. You've taught thousands of women self-defense. Your Airstream has like this panel that has all the signatures from all the people's lives you've changed. And, you know, you, what does success how would, how would you celebrate that success? I think so many entrepreneurs, we have this end goal in mind, but we fail to celebrate. We fail to recognize that like this seemingly shitty idea actually freaking worked. <laughs> so what does success look like to you? Yeah, I, and I think I'm, uh, I'm a person that success feels like instead of looks like. So you know, if I've been able to have the impact and the positive change that I want in a way that does not damage me physically, emotionally, spiritually, then I'm a success, regardless of, you know, what the numbers are, because if the numbers are negative, then I actually am damaging myself, even if I don't feel it right now. Um, so, I mean, that's a big thing, but, but I think that's a separate question. And I think your question of how do you celebrate is the unasked question in business so often these days, because people, I think, again, are, you know, are finding ways to feel successful or be successful um, and know what that looks like, but they still often don't know how to celebrate it. And so um, a couple of things, one is a, just another plug for Profit First, which forces you to celebrate quarterly by taking your profit distribution and doing something nice for yourself. Um, and I think some of it is to look 
towards the organizations like nonprofit organizations that have that sort of stuff built into their culture, which could be, you know, an annual retreat or an annual gala or, a, a, you know, even just a virtual summit of like, let's all like just do this, celebrate this together. It could just be, you know, sitting on a cliff watching the sunset and just taking some time to just meditate on like, dude, <laughs> that was awesome. Like that's legit. Celebrations don't have to cost anything or involve anyone else. But again, it's just about really um, absorbing that feeling of like, you did this, or at least you facilitated this, which is still you doing it. And like, I think we just forget to kind of breathe in our own power sometimes because it doesn't feel like enough. Right. When it's already so much better than most people. Yeah. And so kind of on the counterpoint of that, oftentimes we strive for this thing and sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes we find that like maybe the best business model isn't traveling to 50 states in 52 weeks in a biodiesel airstream teaching self-defense. Maybe that doesn't work. Right. Sounds pretty stressful. <laughs> it sounds kind of stressful. Like not all ideas end up where we think they should go. So how do you do, how do you deal with or work through this, you know, this idea of failure? Yeah. And <laughs> I think failure is great. It sucks. Again, it's one of those things that it sucks. It feels terrible. It's shitty, much like setting a boundary. You know, nobody wants to have to send a boundary. Nobody wants to have to be like, you are pissing me off and I need you to stop the behavior that you so clearly want to have. But um, it, it doesn't have to feel good to be a good thing, right? Telling someone to not talk to you without a, a level of respect and dignity is not comfortable, fun, or easy. You may not like doing it, but it's, but it's important and necessary. So again, you know, there's, there's, there's different kinds of failures. One is you can't succeed without failing, you know, or, or you haven't really learned, you've just done something you already knew how to do, which again, no judgment. Like that's great. If you want to stay in that comfort zone, go for it. It's all about you, right? That's why we're in business so that we can decide for ourselves what we want to do. Um, so yeah, plan for failure, hope to fail. Hope to fail small, you know, not devastating, not bankruptcy like I got to do, but hope to fail small. But again, like out of that failure, I, boy, did that bring me clarity about what I needed to learn and what I needed to do. And I would never have gotten to the place where I am now if I hadn't had that experience. So, you know, and again, that feels like success, being able to look at really shitty things and be like, well, I was able to use my alchemical powers and turn that lead into gold that I'm able to like make use of. Um, so I think, you know, to me, what feels like a poopy failure would be clinging too tightly to an idea and letting it drag you down. Um, so I have a friend who ran a very beautiful cheese shop in Seattle. She was amazing at what she did. She seemed to be doing all of the right things. Like she had a stall in a building instead of having her own building. Um, but it was just not modeled well financially. And again, she did not at the time have the literacy to say, this is a slow path to hell. So she um, totally over leveraged herself, stressed herself out physically to the point of sickness. And her decision was, I think I'm going to do a Kickstarter to open a restaurant, a wine and cheese restaurant, so that I can sell more of the product and generate more income and hopefully have that carry. And eventually both the businesses crashed. And she wrote this beautiful article that I can't find anymore, um, just sort of saying, I, I really wish that I had stopped sooner, you know, because she, she literally made herself sick and it took her a while to recover from that. So the, this like stubborn idea that success only looks one way. Um, and now I think is a perfect time for that. There's a lot of people's great plans that are being ruined right now. And we all have to sort of stop and be like, okay, so what, 
if I want to do this thing, if I want to produce this feeling or experience for people and I can't do it in the way that I want it, what would one step back be? And so for me, it might be something like, um, and in fact, the self-defense group in, in New York has done this. They are putting on some of the verbal only pieces in Zoom. So they're still doing some of their trainings in a very safe way. So people are still learning some of the skills, um, you know, and it might be that I would develop a curriculum and, you know, and, and try to bring people from the 50 states to me and then send them back out so that I could have that same 50 state impact without having to put the Winnebago on a boat <laughs> to get to Hawaii, <laughs> which they do in Sicily. They put a train on a boat, so it could be done. <laughs> well, I mean, of course it can be done. Right? Yeah. No stopping us. No stopping us. Yeah. Um, so if somebody is like on the precipice of starting their shitty idea or even in the weeds a little bit, um, what is your final piece of advice, a word of wisdom for that person who's just a little scared about the next step? Oh, please be scared about the next step. If you're not scared about the next step, it may not be that, it may not be that great. I mean, I, you know, you should feel good and scared at the same time because being, being, feeling fear and being in danger are two different things. And our body confuses those a lot because it feels really similar, but like fear and excitement feel similar too. And so again, a lot of times we're like, oh, I must be terrified because this is a shitty idea as opposed to, I must be, you know, excited because I'm about to try something new. And again, let's all remember the first time we got on a bike or got behind the wheel and fell flat on our faces because that's what learning looks like. So yes, go fuck it up. Um, I, I get support, honestly, get support. If you're worried, I just, I cannot overstate the value of someone experienced beyond, you know, a family member or a friend who wants to be your cheerleader, but may not be like, have you thought about, you know? Um, because again, another one of my least favorite things, you, it takes money to make money. I mean, yeah, sometimes, but so many things were born out of nothing, you right? I mean, there's entire businesses making masks right now because people had some extra handkerchiefs or t-shirts or, you know, whatever. Um, so necessity is the mother of invention. I think it's great to always think about, is there some other way other than spending money that I could get this done at least as well? Um, but yeah, find your, find your group, find your homies, find your sewing circle, get those people close to you, keep them close. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Ian, for going on this crazy adventure with me and proving that shitty ideas are not so shitty. Shitty ideas are awesome. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate you. Um, will you share where people can find you, how to get in touch? Who, yeah. who you even want to get in touch with you? <laughs> I, if you're nice. If you're nice and you're fun, you can get in touch with me. <laughs> I'm guessing that's like everybody that's listening though. So yeah, we have a website. It's uh, www.moxiebookkeeping.com, M-O-X-I-E, and then my favorite word, B-O-O-K-K-E-E-P-I-N-G.com, Jeopardy question, the only word in the English language with three doubles. Um, we're on Facebook. We have a face, a free private Facebook group called Profit First for Creatives for people who are dabbling in the Profit First cash management methodology, but um, don't necessarily want to commit. They just want to talk about it. Cool. Come on in. Um, Instagram, Moxie Bookkeeping, LinkedIn, the, us the usual. Awesome. Cool. I hi highly recommend Ian. I highly recommend Mo Moxie. You guys are putting out so much good education in the world and I love you for it. Um, Thanks, man. So thank you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. <laughs> thank you, Ian, so very much. And thank you for listening. Before you go, wait just a moment. If you would be so kind and so generous as to leave me a review, it would really mean the world to me. I would love to know that this podcast is making a difference. So if you liked Ian's episode, if you got something out of it, please just let us know in the review section. Just be like, Ian's episode was awesome. That would help 
so much. And if you have a friend who has a shitty idea um, or a great idea or who is starting a business, please share that this podcast with them as well. I will see you next week when I get to talk to the founder of Blue Daisy Consulting, Moji, about sustainability and small business. I can't wait to share this with you. I will talk to you then.